that uh, women have written and um, that um, it looks at, at, at being a mother or being, you know, going through, um, what, uh, struggling in society as a woman, uh, what people think of women, uh, what the media thinks, uh, what politicians think about women. And um, so I, uh, I'd like to start with uh, two works from uh, Ai Lala, the poems of Lal Dev, uh, translated by Ranjit Hoskote. He's been here uh, at the Literary Festival and he's read from, from his translations. It's a, a beautiful book uh, that he wrote out a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, Lal Dev was this Kashmiri poet who lived in the 14th century. and. Um, and, and two of her poems um, are some. Some critics say that they're about, you know, that they're, they're describing the struggle it is to be a woman. Uh, Ranjit says, uh, no, it's uh, it's you know all the struggles you go through to um, to achieve uh, a state of uh, bliss. So, um, but that's up to the to the listener and to the reader to interpret you know, what you feel about the poem. Um, and I actually also agree with Ranjit. But, but, uh, but this is uh, 38 and 39 from, from uh, the poems of Lalde. <clears throat> I, Lala, set out to bloom like a cotton flower. The cleaner tore me. The carder shedded me on his boat. That gossamer, that was I, the spinning woman lifted from her wheel. <coughs> At the weavers, they hung me out on the loom. First, the washerman pounded me on his washing stone, scrubbed me with clay and soap, then the tailor measured me, piece by piece, with the scissors. Only then could I, Lala, find the road to heaven. Blossom live when the tree is dead? 
life of my life, death's bitter sword has severed us like a broken word. Rent us in twain, who are but one. Shall the flesh survive when the soul is gone? Women have struggled for the right to vote and in India we got the right to vote. <coughs> Um, but in the U.S., uh, when women were struggling for the right to vote, uh, this is, I, I'm quoting from a speech given by uh, a woman called uh, Sojourner Truth at the Women's Rights Convention in the history of women's suffrage. But, um, but this woman, she, um, she was an African-American woman. I can't speak with the accent that uh, she spoke with. Uh, but uh, I'm reading this because there's another poem later by um, an Indian poem uh, which, uh, which I, I see echoes of this and that, so that's why I'm just reading from this speech. It's from 1851. Well, children, when there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the niggers of the South and the women of the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there says that women need to be held into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any my best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me, look at me. Look at my arm, she did this. I have ploughed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could help me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man, when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I've grown thirteen children, and seen the most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. Ain't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. What does they call it? Intellect, whispered someone. That's it, honey. What's that got to do with women's rights or niggas' rights? If my cup won't hold but a pint and yours will a quart, won't you be me not to let me have my little half measure full? Then that little man in black there, he says women can't have as many rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with it. Um, she talks about Eve. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right up again. Right side up again. And now they're asking to do it. The men better let us. <coughs> So, that was 1851. And then we have Aditi Rao, in 2011, Delhi. There was a slut walk in Delhi, and um, Mr. Lalu Prasad Yadav uh, uh, in Parliament, uh, this is reported in the Parliament Zero in the Hindu, he said, Referring to the recent slut walk held in the capital, Mr. Lalu Prasad Yadav said, we have naked women walking down the streets with tattoos on their cheeks, whereas Indian women did not even look up while walking. So, this is called, Dear Mr. Yadav, I too am an Indian woman. I'm not always sure what you are, Laluji. <coughs> But I know you're not an Indian woman. I am an Indian woman. And I look up while walking. I sit Ghora Tang on motorcycles. I ride airplanes as comfortably as rickety buses. I run barefoot through sand. I cook aloo gobi and chicken tikka. 
and it's concrete more easily than I meant to party. I am still an Indian woman. My mother raised me on puzzles, books, clouds. She does not want me to write this poem. She too is an Indian woman. My grandmother walked out of a bad marriage, learned to drive, got a job, knit my childhood sweaters. She too is an Indian woman. I balance marbles on pebbles, use matchbooks as playing cards, race tires through smog. I can wrap <coughs> six yards of silk into a sensuous sari. I wear a dupatta to the mosque and the gurdwara. I am more often seen in jeans and orange slippers. I am still an Indian woman. I have a sister with four tattoos and a Facebook photo showing her braless bare back. She's not an Indian woman, but not because of the tattoos of their back. I hold young women through their tears and young men through their tears, and I ask friends for hugs when I need to be held. Sometimes these friends are men. I do not then sleep with them. But if we ever both want to, I may. I am still an Indian woman. I avoided a road because of a man who stood there 14 years ago. I'm anxious in tight crowds that carry memories of touch and helplessness. I'm learning to shimmy out of colors I did not choose. I remain an Indian woman. On Diwali, I stain my, I stain my eyelids with kajal and my fingers with the smell of marigold. I'm not less beautiful when I turn compost and smell of sweat. I make excellent chai with adrak and dalchini. I drink my coffee black. I love without apology. I am still an Indian woman. I have a friend who called the cops when her father hit her mother. I have gay friends. I have friends who were raped. I tell them they are more important than family honor. They are Indian women and so am I. I tell little girls they belong on the football field and in the library no less than the brothers they do not have. They will be Indian women. I have won awards for science and for poetry. I have lived on three continents and chosen this as home. I am an Indian woman. I dream in three languages and make tea for my mother. I find oceans in deserts, weave spider webs from fresh clay. I am 26 and unmarried and not worried. I am still an Indian woman. Bravo. I would like to read another poem by Aditi Rao. It's called The Little Mermaid Was Indian. That is the part they got wrong. The blue eyes were only the sea turned inward. The darkest skin will pucker into white underwater. It does not make me less of who I am. I grew up worshipping a woman proved pure by burning. Can you blame my grandmother then for her counsel about pride and pain? Everyone, from married arts to rapist cops and shadi.com, warns me of the danger of my voice, promises men will love me for my hips and eyes. The tongue was not a sacrifice. It was the price for immortality. As for the prince, I know a man who does not notice bleeding feet is never worth them. It was never about him. But don't we all tire sometimes of the colors we grow up with? Even as a girl, I love being something else. Travel is the greatest disguise. Murder did not scare me, but I knew an Indian woman who leaves for love of adventure or man or horseback lessons never returns. The father, grieves from a distance, won't swim to her shore. The grandma is always losing hair. It is a constant choice between love and family. That is the ultimate sacrifice, the absence of guarantees.
the next poem is by Anamika. She writes in Hindi, um, and but I'm reading this poem in English. Uh, it's translated uh, by her and by Ali inside. It's called Without a Place. This is how the shloka goes. Women, nails and hair, once they've fallen, just can't be put back, said our Sanskrit teacher. Frozen in place out of fear, we girls held on tight to our seats. Place? What is this place? We were shown our place in the first grade. We remembered our elementary school lessons. <coughs> Ram? Go to school, sir. Radha, go and cook. Ram, here's your candy, sir. Radha, bring your broom. Ram, bedtime, school tomorrow. Radha, go and make the bed for brother. Ah, this is our new house. Look, Ram, here's your room. And mine? Oh, little Louie. Birds, the wind, the sun, and the good earth. They have no homes. Those without a home, where do they belong? Mm -hmm. First, and I will read it in English. It's translated by the Tanya. Mm -hmm. It's called Ham Gunahadar Aurate. Ye Ham Gunahadar Aurate. So, Ehen et Ubaki Tantana se Narok hai, Na Jan Gate, Na Saju hai, Na Hat Jodi. ये हम गुनाहगार औरतें हैं कि जिनके जिस्मों की फसल बेचे जो लोग वो सर फराज ठहरे नयाबते इम्तियाज ठहरे वो दावे अहले सास ठहरे ये हम गुनाहगार औरतें हैं कि सच का परचम उठा के निकली तो झूठ से शाराएं अति मिली हैं हरे तेरीस पे सजाओं की दास्तानें रखी मिली हैं जो बोल सकती थी वो जबाने कटी मिली हैं ये हम गुनाहगार औरतें हैं कि अब ताकुब में रात भी आए तो ये आंखें नहीं मिलेंगी कि अब जो दीवार गिर चुकी है उसे उठाने का जिद न करना ये हम गुनाहगार औरतें हैं जो अहले जुबा की तंतनत से न रोक खाए न जान बेचे न सर झुकाए न हाथ छोड़े translated as we sinful women. It is we sinful women who are not awed by the grandeur of those who wear gowns, who don't sell our lives, who don't bow our heads, who don't fold our hands together. It is we sinful women while those who sell the harvests of our bodies become exalted, become distinguished, become the just princes of the material world. It is we sinful women who come out, raising the banner of truth, up against barricades of lies on the highways, who find stories of persecution piled on each threshold, who find that tongues which could, have, which could speak have been severed. It is we sinful women now even if the night gives chase, these eyes shall not be put out. For the wall which has been raised, don't insist on raising it now again. It's we sinful women who are not awed by the grandeur of those who wear gowns, who don't sell our bodies, who don't bow our heads, who don't fold our hands together. Another part is 
study good, uh, who writes in English, and her name is Kaila Pasha. And um, her poem is called Don't Know Love, But I Can Swing. Well versed in the syncopations of love's first calls, and fully read up on the sonnets available from the muse, this spark swing finds me an avid follower of a new way. I don't know love anymore, but I do know swinging in the park. And I find it hard to fathom that there's any depth left in the subject that cannot be plumbed by kicking the ground hard and having your head lurch into your mouth indecently. Love is, after all, only an abstract way to trip yourself repeatedly and blame it on someone. And heartbreak is every scraped knee, gravel and blood embedded obscenely in each other. I'd rather wait to my fortune on a swing, tied with ropes too long, than a man tied with words and promises to me. Tied with words and promises? No. I'd rather fight gravity, lose and fight again, than love a man and love a man, and come down, hit the ground, and love a man again. called The Mother. 
Abortions will not let you forget. You remember the children you got that you did not get. The damp small bugs with the little orb with no hair. The singers and workers that never handled the air. You will never neglect a beat them or silence or buy with a sweet. You'll never wind up the sucking thumb or scuttle up ghosts that come. You'll never leave them controlling your luscious sigh. Return for a smack of them with gobbling mother eye. I've heard in the voices of the wind, the voices of my dim killed children. I've contracted, I've eased my dim dears at the breast they could never suck. I've said, sweets, if I sinned, if I seize your luck and your lies from your unfinished reach, if I stole your births and your names, your straight baby tears and your games, your stilted, your lovely loves, your marriages, aches and your debts, if I poison the beginnings of your breaths, believe that even in my deliberateness, I was not deliberate. So why should I whine? Whine that the crime was other than mine? Since any hour you are dead, or rather, or instead, you were never made. But that too, I am afraid, is faulty. Or what shall I say? How is the truth to be said? You were born, you had body, you died. It's just that you never giggled, or planned, or cried. Believe me, I loved you all. Believe me, I knew you, though faintly, and I loved. I loved you all. <coughs> and then there's the river of girls, like the Shani Toshi, but India's missing girls. This is not really myth or secret. This murmur in the mouth of the mountain where the sound of rain is born, the surging past pilgrim town and village fair, this coin thin vagina and acid stain of bone, this doctor with his rusty tools, the street cleaner, this mother laying down the bloody offerings of birth. This is not the cry of a beginning of, or a river buried in the bowels of the earth. This is the sound of 10 million girls singing of a time in the universe when they were born with tigers, breathing between their thighs, when they set out for battle with all three eyes on fire, their golden breasts held high like weapons.
comes to me weeping, mm -hmm. raising her tiny frock, mm -hmm. shows me her chubby stomach and whimpers. Amma, look, is there a baby in my belly? Anyone will laugh out at those words, but I stand still, mind and body burning. The bud lights ellipse tremble. Amma, will they cut open my belly to take out the baby? He told me so. Oh God, this little one is so tortured. This little one, bitten and tossed, bitten and tossed by cruel lust. This little one who cried aloud in front of the seat of justice. When she asks this question, I can see hell's gaping jaws. I try to soothe her. I try to laugh. There's nothing in my little one's belly but today's roti. Nothing else. Who will dare to cut open my child? No one will touch you. Is it true? She asks. Amma, you promise it's true. I touch her hand and give my word. Yes, it's true. She laughs and runs away. Then I see her jumping up and down, laughing, playing with her friends. Looking at her, I understand the strength of childhood. The baby tear licks a wound and heals herself. When your children grow up and leave home, you always worry about them. And this poem is written by an American poet called Linda Bastan from, um, it's from her book, The Imperfect Paradise. And it's called Two Daughter Leaving Home. When I taught you at eight to ride a bicycle, loping along beside you as you wobbled away on two round wheels, my own mouth rounding in surprise when you pulled a head down the curved path of the park, I kept waiting for the third of your crash. As I sprinted to catch up, while you grew smaller, more breakable with distance, Pumping, pumping for your life, screaming with laughter, the hair flapping behind you like a handkerchief, waiting to buy. like this one, where her children once sat fidgeting for the bell to ring so they could grab their jackets and shout out loud to the cold air and sun, shining on Broadway two blocks from home, where two flights up she had to set out bread and milk on the kitchen table because she was down the street at the tailor shop, turning a shirt collar, amending a man's coat. At night she got down on her hands and knees to wash floors in an office building on 2nd Avenue, things she had learned as a girl in Poland, and brought with her a boat ride away to Ellis Island, to the man she married, and soon enough their four children, one dead one, and after he died of influenza, to the new husband and his five children, one dead one, and in time to the new daughters-in-law and sons-in-law in their uptown apartments and the babies one at a time. She sat practicing her farmer letters connecting the fine threads of ink each graceful curve moving to the next and this one is about old aunts my old aunts play canasta in a snowstorm by Marjorie Cesar I ride along in the back seat the aunt who can drive the aunt who can drive picks up each sister at her door keeps the contact chugging in to drive away while one or the other slips into her overshoes and steps out, closing her door with a click. The wind lifting the fringe of her white cotton scarf, she comes down the sidewalk, still pulling on her new polyester Christmas stocking and mittens. 
We have no business to be out in such a storm, she says. No business at all. The wind takes her voice and swirls it, like snow across the windshield. We're on to the next house, the next aunt. The heat is blowing to beat the band. At the last house, we play canasta. The juice is wild, even as they were in childhood. The wind blowing through the empty apple trees. Through the shadow of bumper crops, the guards line up under my aunt's finger bones. Eights and nines and aces struggle and fall into place like well-behaved children. My aunts shuffle and meld, they laugh like banshees. As they did in that other kitchen in the 30s that day, Margaret draped a dish towel over her face to answer the door. We put her up to it, they say, laughing. We pushed her. The man, whoever he was, drove off in a half while they laughed till they got. Laughing still, I'm one of the girls, laughing him down the sidewalk and into his car. The rascals showed us farmyard dogs, the white card players, the snow thickens, the coffee boilers, and bugs. The wind is a red tray, because, as one of the others says, we're getting up there in the years, we'll have to sit sometime. But today, today, deal, sister, deal. This poem is called, What Are Big Girls Made Of? And it's by Marge Piercy. The construction of a woman. A woman is not made of flesh, of bone and sinew, belly and breasts, elbows and liver and toe. She's manufactured like a sports cell. She's retooled refitted and redesigned every decade. Cecil had been seduction itself in college. She wriggled through bars like a satin eel. Her hips are mass promising. Her mouth burst in the dark red lipstick of desire. She visited in 68, still wearing skirts. Tight to the knees, dark red lipstick. While I danced through Manhattan in miniskirts, lipstick pays her to cut off, hair loose as a horse's mane. Oh dear, I thought in my superiority of the moment. Whatever has happened to poor Sissy? She was out of fashion, out of the game, disqualified, disdained dismembered from the club of desire.
to French fashion magazines of the 18th century. Century of the ultimate lady in fantasy brought us silk and gossiping. Barriers bring her hips up three feet. Each way, when the waist is pinched and the belly flattened under wood, the breasts are stuffed and up out, offered like apples in a bowl. The tiny foot is encased in a slipper, never meant for walking. On top is a grandiose headache, hair like a museum piece, daily ornamented with ribbons, vases, grottos, mountains, frigates in full sail, balloons, baboons, the fancy of a hairdresser turned loose. The hats were Rococo wedding cakes that would dim the Las Vegas Strip. Here is a woman forced into shape, rigid, exoskeleton torturing flesh, a woman made of pain. Pretty women 
wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model's size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the spread of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. walk into a room, just the school as you please, and to a man the fellows stand or fall, on, or fall down on their knees. Then they swarm around me, a hive of honeybees. I say, it's the fire in my eyes and the flash of my teeth, the swing in my waist and the joy in my feet. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, it's in the arch of my back, the sun of my smile, the ride of my breasts, the grace of my style. I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. Now you understand just what my just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. It ought um, when you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say, it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care, because I'm a woman. Phenomenal. Phenomenal woman. That's me.